Good evening. Thank you all so much for being here, those of you who are in the room and those of you who are watching on our live stream. Uh, it's such an honor to have Ruth Slenchenska here with us this evening. Uh, she is, this is a real, real treat for us. She is the last living pupil of Sergei Rachmaninoff uh, and is just an abs, has been a was a child prodigy, you can read in her biography. She has been famous since she was about five. Um, it's mildly upsetting to have someone that good at such a young age, but it's, she's such a delightful person that it is great. Um, I'd like to thank a couple people for making this possible. Shelley Mormon Stallman, who has been hosting Ruth uh, through this pandemic, uh, for Mary Lemons and Scott Ramirez for all their help and support. Of course, to Dick Han, uh, the, the head of the Arts Alive Committee. Uh, please do check in your program for all the upcoming programs. Uh, and for those of you watching online, we will have uh, information on dairyprez.org. We're very fortunate in several ways to have this program. Uh, Ruth normally would be a very expensive, um, and but she's agreed to do this program for a donation to uh, the Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired in Chester, Pennsylvania. And we're very, very grateful to our very own Greg and Lois Harris for underwriting that donation. We will also be taking an offering for those of you in the room. Uh, there will be boxes on your way out, so we do ask that you give as generally as generously as possible. And those of you online, uh, just mail a check to the church, and we'll get that sent off to there. And now, without further ado, please welcome Ruth Slenchenska.
Hello, my friends. Some of you may be wondering how come in an all Chopin program I start with a barber nocturne. Well, <clears throat> there's, you might be interested in the background for this. A few days ago, I got a telephone call from His Excellency, the ambassador to the United States from the country of Poland, except that he didn't tell me that until somewhere in the middle of the conversation. He told me, this is Piotr. Who's Piotr? Piotr Walczak, the ambassador, Polish ambassador. You should know me. Well, and he continued to talk. He was one of these people who talk, talk, talk. You don't get a word in edgewise. And at the end of the conversation, I realized I had committed myself to playing a all Chopin program in his ambassadorial residence in Washington, D.C. to uh, celebrate his, the end of his five-year tour of duty in the United States. And so I'm giving you the same program that I'm playing for him. And because it's an official program, I must include because I am a proud citizen of the United States. I was born in Sacramento, California. I was told by the then ambassador to Japan, who was Carolyn Kennedy, the daughter of our president. And she said that it was her duty to inform me that whenever I play an official program, I must include an American composer. So you get Samuel Barber. And incidentally, Sam was a fellow student with me at Curtis Institute all those years ago. I was only five then. I'm 96, that's more than 90 years ago. And he gave me a bit of musical advice that I treasure because it's different from anything that any teacher ever told me. He said, when you play, you must show your audience how beautiful the music is, not how well you play. That's a very, very important bit of advice. And I repeat it to myself every concert, and I've played more than 3,000 of them all over the world. Carolyn Kennedy wrote me this letter because she could not attend the reception that Her Majesty, Her Imperial Majesty, the Empress of Japan, was giving for me. Just matter of a couple of years ago, this COVID thing really took over. <laughs> well, I'll talk to you later.
My next offerings are going to be miniatures, but each of them is very meaningful. You might wonder what pianists think about when they play. Well, each, as far as I'm concerned anyway, I don't want to speak for everybody, but when I play, there's always an incident or a story or a person or something that's, I can think about that belongs to that particular composition. And so I thought it might be nice to share with you what I think about for the next four pieces, which are miniature in comparison to what I've just played. Yeah. Now, the first one is the first prelude of Chopin. Well, Chopin always wanted to do what Bach did, write 24 preludes in all the keys, every one of the piano keys, and he succeeded. He tried with the etudes, but it didn't work because he thought of too many ideas that he wanted in special keys, and so he gave up on the etudes. But by the time he reached Opus 28 and the Preludes, he succeeded. And you know the one that he left for last was number one, just in case. So I wanted a special sound for number one. And I tried and I tried and tried. One day I was visiting my sister-in-law up in Naperville, Illinois, and she had four boys going to school at that time. And they all came home for lunch, and so just before they were due, which was about noontime, I was in the kitchen with my sister-in-law. We were working on the sandwiches and the salads that they were going to have for lunch. And she said, I certainly hope that Tommy comes through with his arithmetic. He was so worried about it that he just kept asking her to make up questions for him so that he could get his arithmetic straightened out. He worried about his arithmetic. Little kid, about so high. So anyway, here we were fixing sandwiches, and then one boy came home and another boy came home. And then finally came Tommy. He was out of breath. He was, had been running all the way. He was waving. I got an A in arithmetic. And I got the sound I want for the first prelude. That's what you call a real lesson from life. Right. The second prelude that I'm playing for you 
was the first really difficult etude that I learned for the left hand, playing for you number three in G major. And it is a very, very taxing thing for the left hand alone of a little small girl. I was about five years old at the time in trying to play this etude. And this is the story of how number three came along. I couldn't reach the pedals, so I didn't bother with pedal. I just had to have every single note of this etude clean and clear. And I was told it had to sound like running water in a brook. I surely tried. I'm still trying. <laughs> the third one is the B minor. And the reason I'm doing that, doing that in memory of a good friend. In Europe, musicians all know each other, sort of, because we all travel in this milieu. We all play for each other, we all know each other, we all visit together. The United States is a huge country. We don't get the same opportunities. But in Europe, you can cross a country in five hours. So the countries are small and more compatible to knowing each other that way. And we had friends in Europe. And among our musician friends was a cellist, his wife, whom we met in Budapest. I had concerts to play there. And so I was rehearsing in the hall, and there came this nice gentleman, and he started to speak English to me, which was so nice because I couldn't speak Hungarian. And uh, his name was Janos Starker. In Europe, this is, he's recognized as one of the great cellists, was at that time already. And he had come to the concert hall in hopes of hearing me play because I was a child prodigy and he wanted to hear what I sounded like. So, of course, we made friends and we talked and wound up, I gave him my Paris address because he was going to play in Paris. Told him, look us up because my mother will be so pleased to meet you. And he came to our house and Paris, we had dinner together, he brought his wife along. Then time passed, you know, you go all around the world, you play concerts, 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 concerts. You remember certain friends. I played in Chicago. And the first cellist there, there was my friend Jano Starker playing. So after the rehearsal was over at Grant Park, and they said, did you bring a sonata along so that we could play? And we played together, and we got to talking again about old times. And he had such a sad story to tell. He was a refugee. They escaped on foot from the Russians leave everything behind except your most precious things and walk away. And he and his wife had to do this. At one point, it took days and days, but they had friends that they knew they could meet in Czechoslovakia. So they walked from Hungary, Budapest, to Czechoslovakia with him carrying his cello. Not an easy, light instrument. Wife carrying the suitcases. At one point, he, she didn't look right to him. And so he said to her, when is the last time you ate? And she said, I don't remember.
That's the story of my B minor prelude. The fourth prelude that you'll hear, well, I traveled with my 24 preludes all over the world, but at that time I was young and I was traveling in South America. And I was working on stage on my concert piano while the workers were taking away the scenery from the play that they had on stage the night before. And one of the workers kind of sidled toward the piano and started listening to me practice this. And in broken English, he said to me, soul climbing to heaven? He told me what he heard in it. And I always remember, I played it for my mother when she died. Played it for my sister Helen, the funeral services. I played it for my friend Vladimir Horowitz at the year memorial after his death, at the request of his wife. She remembered my playing that, and so I played it for him. Now, I'll play it for you. And the last piece on the program, Grand Vals Brilliant, means an awful lot to a person who grew up in Europe because waltzes are not just a dance that you dance in a ballroom. A waltz is sort of a coming out party for a young lady. And they work hard to learn the steps of a waltz. They want a special gown for the first time that they go to a place where there's going to be a grand waltz brilliant. It's a grand waltz, not just an ordinary waltz. This is the first waltz in Chopin's book of waltzes. And I hope you can hear in it all the, the dreams of the young ladies who dance this waltz. And we're looking forward. Will he be handsome? Will he be rich? Will he <laughs> All the dreams that little girls dream about for what their husbands will be.
this pandemic has brought much hardship, death, and especially separation to many of us. But I understand you are in central Pennsylvania because of the pandemic, <laughs> right? So we are reaping the benefit of this piano royalty today here at Derry. Thank you so much. There, there can't be a concert without an audience. So I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience, being an inspiring audience, and I hope you'll go to lots of wonderful concerts. <laughs> this is just a little taste of central Pennsylvania. So. <laughs> okay. sure. okay. Slide that off. The Moravian Star is special to those of us in central Pennsylvania. Oh, I wonder. <laughs> well, you know what my next Christmas tree is going to show. <laughs> You'll be with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. 